So next up, we have Katie Rojas from the University of Virginia. She's going to be presenting comparative description and metadata migration at the University of Virginia's Albert Shirley Small Special Collection. Uh, since 2020, the Technical Services Unit at the University of Virginia's Albert and Shirley Small Special Collections Library has been identifying opportunities for comparative description in existing records. To date, they have identified over 350 finding aids in need of free description. They are now prepared to implement these updates. However, legacy descriptive metadata was not migrated to archive space when UVA adopted the system in 2015. Ideally, they want all metadata centralized in archive space, but the labor required for this migration is currently prohibitive. Therefore, as an initial step, UVA has decided to focus on prioritizing reparative redescription. In this presentation, Katie will outline their strategy for updating descriptive metadata and migrating it from various legacy systems and formats into archive space. Take it away. Hi, everyone. So um, I am the head of technical services at the University of Virginia Small Special Collections. Um, and I'm going to tell you guys about some grand plans I have. Um, we'll see how they go. <laughs> um, a little bit of context about the University of Virginia, um, our history and who we are. Um, there's about 30 of us roughly in special collections and preservation. Um, and I have five archivists in technical services, um, and we also have catalogers in that unit as well. Um, our ASpace instance, there's four repositories sharing one instance. Um, so I'm just talking about my my uh, special collections instance. Uh, excuse me, my my repository, um, and. We also have the privilege of local IT support, so I could not do a lot of the things that I want to do uh, without their help. <laughs> so the university itself was established in Charlottesville, Virginia by Thomas Jefferson in 1812. Uh, Monticello is a state, is nearby, um, and so he looms very large in the history of the university and the community. Um, and Special Collections was established as the Manuscripts Division of the Main Library in 1938. The library was called the Alderman Library. That has just been changed this year to the Shannon Library. Um, and that is tied directly to the history of our university and who those people were. So the university itself you know, being basically a product of the early 1800s and Thomas Jefferson, um, the university did rely on the labor of enslaved people to physically construct buildings on ground. Um, and they also employed the labor of enslaved people to do whatever needed to be done. Um, so, it, it was largely people who um, enslaved others, kind of sharing out their, their laborers to the university. Um, though I believe there is some evidence that the university itself did enslave people. Um, there is also a history of eugenics at the university. And Edwin Alderman, the library's original namesake, um, is directly tied to that. So he was a big proponent of that and creating that as like a field of study at the university. Um, obviously that is no longer, but that is a large and very direct reason as to why the name of the library was changed. Um, and then also the university uh, started only with white male students and faculty. Um, it was not until 1950 that the first black student um, was admitted to the university, and that was because he sued um, the university to be admitted. And, you know, full integration was strongly resisted until the university was forced to desegregate in the 60s. Um, and then there were a few women who attended the university, uh, it, like starting around the 1920s, but the first co-ed class did not come along until the <coughs> 1970s. So, 
<laughs> with all of that in mind, um, we in technical services, um, oh, well, excuse me, I should explain this picture as well. Um, the picture is the <coughs> university's memorial to enslaved laborers. Um, and so that was constructed in 2019. Um, it should have been dedicated in 2020, but we all know what happens there. So there was a little bit of a delay, but it has been on campus since 2019. Um, and there are like larger university groups dedicated to, um, you know, its maintenance and, um, you know, sharing this part of the history with the university is definitely something that's recognized now. Um, so in 2020, uh, when everybody was working from home, the technical services unit developed what we call the IRAP, the Inclusion and Recreative uh, Description Action Plan. And as part of that, there were like multiple steps. So like, I think it was about 11 different steps that addressed our cataloging and archival description practices in technical services. and how we wanted to address or change things. Um, because we have description that exists going back to the 30s, um, we definitely have a lot of language that is in need of change. And one of the things that we decided to do was to prioritize this work. So if we have something that comes in, a new collection, a new edition, um, we prioritize processing that. And if we have something that is found, one of the things that the IRAP established was a system for flagging those things, like, oh, I found something that needs to be changed, something that needs to be highlighted, you know, um, like, enslaved people are represented in these records, but it's not really talked about very much, you know, we need to do some work to elevate that. Um, so we have a system to flag those things bring the materials to technical services and have us do some redescription. As part of that, um, we completed an audit of our finding aids. And so we searched two different systems. We have our OPAC and then we also have um, the archival resources of the Virginias, um, Arvis, which is a consortial finding aid website. So we searched both of those systems um, to identify records that needed redescription. Um, and we evaluated those using an in-house creative rubric to sort of prioritize which ones needed attention like more immediately. Um, and so far we've identified about 350 finding aids. So, Archival description lives in a lot of different places for us. Um, we have paper collection guides that were typed on a typewriter. Sometimes we have handwritten inventories. Um, we have word process files stored on a network drive. We have EAD online through Arvis, which I mentioned. Um, of course, we have MARC records in our OPAC, which is called Virgo. And we definitely have, you know, mark records that have no corresponding true finding aid. It's just a mark record. Um, and of course we have archive space records. Um, I will point out that no metadata was in, migrated when we implemented in 2015. So we have to consider all these different systems when we're thinking about um, updating language. And then another thing that plays a huge role in a lot of the decisions that I end up having to make in my work is that we have one descriptive record per accession, usually. So if something has 100 accessions, a collection has 100 accessions, you're gonna have 100 records, and they're not really tied together. It's not like you can just click through and say, accession one, click to accession two, no. It's not like that. So it makes finding things really difficult. And it makes the prospect of metadata migration really challenging. So here is what I am starting to do. Um, I have my IT 
support. We have somebody who does do um, you know, development for us and does our ASPACE updates um, and helps us when we need to do stuff um, that you can't just do in the back end with a staff user interface. Um, I also have one archivist who is dedicated to this work. She is contracted with us through the end of January, I believe. So that's a challenge. Um, so right now, we are compiling the list of preferred terminology and subject headings. The broader library that we are part of has a subject access enhancement group that I co-chair um, with our metadata, I can't remember her title, but she's in charge of like the metadata unit at our library. And so that is a group that looks at, you know, subject headings that could potentially be updated. We discuss that, consider if things are going through like Seiko funnels and whatnot. Um, and then we decide on local terms that we want to adopt instead if there are no pending changes from the Library of Congress. So we're using information from that group and changes that we've made there. Um, and also thinking about, you know, some of the ways that we can describe um, different communities better. Um, and part of that is like outlined in the record of action description plan. Um, and of course, we're looking at a whole bunch of different resources. Um, so that is really where we are right now. We're very in the beginning of this. Um, the next step will be drafting the language updates and including content warnings. Um, we did develop content warnings a few years ago and we've been applying those when we find stuff. Um, we have a boilerplate statement that we kind of tweak as needed. Um, and that part is gonna take probably the longest because like I said, we have 350-ish records that need updating. Um, and then, We'll need to identify and save copies of the existing descriptions in our collection control files, uh, just as backup and as um, documentation of like what was changed. And then our IT developer um, will use a Python script to extract EAD metadata and create import spreadsheet number one. <laughs> so I'm thinking we will take our finding aids, our, our EAD finding aids from the consortial finding aid website, identify the ones that you know we need to download, have those in a folder, and then extract the metadata. Um, and that spreadsheet will ideally um, allow the developer to import new resource records um, via the API. The second spreadsheet um, will, I'll have to work with our um, ILS engineer to export MARC records. Um, and so we'll have two different spreadsheets because we're working with like two very different metadata structures. Um, the other part that's gonna take a long time is editing the spreadsheet metadata with the record of description updates um, and doing metadata cleanup. We have, as you can imagine, some pretty messy metadata, um, stuff that's really old that hasn't been, you know, applied consistently over time and, you know, applied with different standards in mind as time changes and moves forward. So, um, you know, that, that will take some time to fix. Um, and then once we are ready, we'll have the IT developer import those two spreadsheets um, to create a bunch of resource records. Um, probably not 350 because some of those, remember, are individual accession level records, so we'll need to sort of combine that. Um, and then requesting removal and shadowing of our old MARC and EAD records. Um, we should be able to do this in bulk uh, via our ILS engineer and the IT developer. Um, and that's because we need to do this because 
Our system, when we publish an archive space record, it is set up to automatically create a new mark record in the catalog um, and then also publish a finding aid in our consortial finding aid website. So it ends up duplicating what we already have. Um, and so we have to either delete or shadow the old records that were created pre A space. So I'm anticipating a lot of challenges and pain points in this process. That was like a very high level overview of the workflow. Um, it's our first time doing something like this. We don't know what we don't know. Um, if you guys have done this, I'd love to hear from you. Um, we have an extremely high number of existing records. So we're just starting with the tip of the iceberg and prioritizing the records, like the 350-ish records that we've identified thus far that we think need reparative redescription. Um, I can tell you right now that we have at least 24,000 um, mark records for our manuscript collections. That doesn't include our university archives. Um, I don't have numbers on those. Um, and just, I, I don't know how many paper only finding aids we have and those haven't been searched. You know, I'm, I'm not sure how we would even begin to do that. Um, I mentioned that, you know, there's messy and inconsistent metadata um, because time, different people. Um, and also our existing EAD and MARC records don't necessarily meet basic requirements for import. So a lot of our um, old finding aids don't have extent or something like that, like just things that are required by DAX and also required by ASPACE. So that's information that we're going to have to come up with and plug in, or at least come up with a placeholder uh, until we can get the correct information. Um, and then also, I mentioned, you know, the, all the different accession records, right? The legacy practice of bibliographic management, description of archival resources. Um, also, locations are not part of this grand plan right now. Um, right now, we have, like, our location kind of managed just in a spreadsheet. Um, and we do have locations recorded in archive space, but it's not everything. Not everything is barcoded. Um, and so that is like a whole separate project, um, which our first presenter um, talked about and did a great job with. I was excited to see that. Um, and then of course we have a myriad of formats. We have EAD, we have MARC, the Word documents, we have paper. Um, and so only our EAD and MARC records have been searched for harmful language. Um, and so we are looking for ways that we might be able to, you know, leverage new advances in technology to um, somehow search those paper finding aids eventually. So um, that's kind of my big high overview of what I'm planning to do um, and I am happy to take any questions or hear any suggestions from you guys and thanks for listening. Thank you. Thank you very much. We've got about one minute for questions or comments if anyone has any questions. Okay. Dawn. Yeah. <laughs> is did you face any resistance trying to champion a narrative description project in an 
execution method. You know, I'm, I'm gonna generally say no. Um, I started at UVA in 2021, and that project had already begun at that point, and you know, it was it was underway. And so actually that was something that was advertised in the job description and you know, like you need to be embracing these kind of principles and this practice. And I was like, oh yeah, I'm interested in that. Um, so it was actually kind of conversely something that attracted me to the position and to the university. And so I'm really glad that we have support from higher up, like all the way up to our dean, absolutely advocating for this kind of work. Thank you. Thank you, Katie.